I am Air Verist on Twitter uh, and uh, Homeric Horror on AO3. I'm in various voice acting projects um, and I write fake sometimes when, when time allows. Uh, and I will be vo voicing uh, our Aaron for this stream and I'll be making him Irish because I want to. I'm Ego. I'm Ego Sweetheart literally everywhere. If you can't find <laughs> me somewhere, I mean, that's on you. Um, <laughs> and I'll be voicing Solix today. Hi, I'm Nora, also known as Anna's sister. You may know me from the Let's Read the Epilogue. My, my precious baby sister. She's the one who... Nora, were you the one that coined the Jake English Drinks Bong Water meme? I think I was. Yeah, she's the one that coined the J.K. English drinks bong water meme. Oh, he does, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Looks like you're back on the beach, prowling around like you're looking for lost coins and trash with a metal detector. Except you're looking for friends and people whose lives you can make a little better with your reality warping powers. Come to think of it, maybe you should be looking for lost coins? You're not exactly made of money right now, to say the least. You look up and see a fishy dude sitting sadly on the shore. Not fishy in the sense that he's suspicious, but in the sense that he literally has fins on his face. Although he's definitely a little fishy in the other sense, too. After a few seconds, he heaves an exaggerated sigh and turns his head in your direction. It seems his brooding has been paused momentarily. Hey. You over there. Yeah, I'm talking to you. The one looking around to see if there's anyone else I'm talking to, when well, you're literally the only other person around for miles. Yes, thank you for pointing to yourself. Are you that alien friend slut everyone keeps talking about? Friend slut? Wow. You tell the guy that, yes, you are the friend slut. It's you. It's basically exactly who you are. It's what you do. Slut for friends. You ask him who called you that in the first place. You're going to need to thank them for giving you such apt terminology which to describe your, with which to describe yourself. Was it Solix? You bet a lot of money that it was Solix. No, it wasn't fucking Solix, God. Jeez, you really are a hyperactive little bulge muncher, aren't you? No, that was something I came up with myself. After hearing everyone talking about you and shower showering you with with praise on Trollium. I'm Aridan, by the way. I'm very rich and very important around here. And by that I mean on this planet. Wow. You sincerely thank Aaron for his nicknaming services. Something tells you that this guy might actually kind of suck, though. God, I suck. My Moira and my Gizmos has both spontaneously realized how much of an ungraceful piece of troll garbage I am recently. And they dumped the hell out of me. Ripped my damn heart out like, like it was a piece of grisly offering to the gods. Aaron turns a dramatic eye to the ocean. Oh, it's time for a feelings jam. Fuck yeah. You can't believe your luck in running into the one motherfucker on the planet desperate enough to tell a complete stranger all his troubles. It's giving you the perfect ammo. Ammo with which to pierce his heart. With like, you know, the power of friendship or something. So I'm like, going through a lot at the moment. Because honestly, at this point, I'm feeling pretty worthless. Nobody wants to deal with me or date me or hate me. Nobody's gonna put up with my unending tidal wave of bullshit, so what even is the point anymore? Nobody wants to be my friend, and I don't blame them. That's not true. You wanna say? No, you wanna scream out, so loudly that the entire length of the beach reverberates with your declaration. Against all better judgement, you want to be his friend. You want to comfort this broken-hearted fish boy. There's definitely something wrong with you. Are you just going to stare at me like that? Listen, I don't do this shit for free. I opened up in front of other people I've never met before, I mean. People pay good money for this shit. A good melodramatic and poor wallow woman from yours truly usually costs a fucking premium. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah, but what was me, etc, etc. Listen, are you gonna give me the cash or what? This guy can't be fucking serious. Why is someone this rich asking you for money? Look, a guy can have hobbies, okay? Sometimes that means taking money from poor people because they saw all me when I was having one of my bigger moods. You understand, right? Oh, awesome. Please pay me for listening to my problems. 
you're starting to get an idea of why people might have gotten sick enough of this guy to dump him without remorse. Calmly, you let Aridan know that you are, simply put, broke as hell. Hmm. Well, that ain't my problem. Tell you what. If you can't compensate me with a cash, maybe we could find an alternative method of payment. Oh god, no. No, 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 shut the fuck up. I'm not talking about anything dirty or heinous or anything. Give me a little bit of fucking credit. Listen, I'm still messed up over Fef and Riss breaking my heart as carelessly as a pair beast knocks over a wine glass shattering it into a million pieces. If you couldn't tell by my beach gazing, I'm very lonely. But what I want is for you to accompany me on a little friendly outing. Oh. Is that all? Because, honestly, you would have tried to get him to do something like that without any sort of silly prompting on his part, much less actual emotional extortion. This guy might be even more desperate for friendship than you are at your worst. But you say sure, you're absolutely down to do anything with him. Really? That's awesome. Aridan tries to crack a light smile and fails. Well, well, I think I'll let you decide well, what we should do together on our little friend date. After all, you're the uh, expert in this. I'll go uh, anywhere you think of. You have uh, an infinity of choices to choose from here. Hot damn, really? You haven't been this overwhelmed with choices ever. You can choose to go anywhere with this rich fish bastard? That's... that's... Okay, maybe having infinite choices is way too much. You have to narrow it down. But you certainly have more options than usual. Or maybe you should just ask him where he wants to go? You decide. So we're gonna do, you're not sure where to go. What do you think, Aridan? I already told you. I will want to go wherever you want to go. God damn it. You were hoping he'd pick up on your lack of clarity on the best decision. Does he really not have anywhere in particular that he wants to go? Well, surely it doesn't matter what you pick. If he's being so insistent on letting you choose. You decide. All right, we are going to teleport to Earth. So that's where you will want to go. That's... fine, I guess. Aridan's frown morphs into a bigger frown. It's clearly not fine for him. Listen, forget this whole thing, actually. I think that, uh... Maybe we just aren't meant to be friends. Given that you couldn't anticipate my needs when you made your decision so carelessly. What the fuck? You thought he was insisting on doing what you wanted. You were completely fine letting him... Oh, God damn it! he's leaving already before you even said anything. You stop paying attention for one freaking text boss, and this is what happens? He's moping his way across the beach away from you like a humongous tool. Ugh, maybe it was for the best. He was giving you some soft zebra vibes, if you're being honest. For once, you don't feel much regret for leaving a guy off your friends list. Game over. Alright, so we are going to watch a movie. Yes. Hell yes. Hell fucking yes, you know what is up. But we are totally in fucking sync. You're not sure if that's a compliment or an insult. No, see, I already have movie tickets. And had them for like a month. And we was planning on going in a few minutes from now anyways. So clearly, we were destined to be together as lifelong fucking pals. Because you knew exactly what we were always going to do. You're sorry? He had movie tickets this whole time? Why didn't he say so? No. You know. You don't. You're a little miffed that he was just expecting you to know what he wanted the whole time, but you're not letting it get to you. Moving on, uh, let's get this show on the fucking road. I'm calling up the airship right now, and we can take a nice little scenic route to watch the planet-renowned classic known as Shrek 2. <laughs> oh my god. What do you say? Your eyes widen a little, and your body instinctively makes a spit-take motion. You're sorry? Shrek 2? Classic? <laughs> Finally! Someone speaking your fucking language! It's an unironic masterpiece that... Suddenly, a hazy memory pops into your head of Shrek and Aridan standing side by side in a desert surrounded by the black void of a cracked sky, and just as quickly it pops into your head, it disappears. Oh boy, what the fuck was that? In your mind, is your mind playing tricks on you? Was Aridan smiling just then? You're not entirely sure why that stuck out to you. 
This vision was so out of place that, were it not for Aradia, you'd just start thinking none of your vague past memories were real. In fact, it almost makes you doubt that any of what you're experiencing is real. And yet, it strikes you as very familiar. Is there something else you forgot, somehow? You refocus on your surroundings. Suddenly, you're on an airship deck, and Aridan's walking in front of you towards the bridge of the ship. Holy fuck, this airship is huge, you say. Also, when did you get here? Uh, you walked on it like any bipedal, quadrupedal, or septipedal alien. What are you talking about? <laughs> Sorry, Shrek was making me so Okay, fine, fucker, I'll just say it again. Welcome to Airship the Ampera. It's practically my second or third home, and basically it's fucking incredible in every way, in every conceivable way. No kidding. The airship could probably fit a few city blocks on it, buildings and all. Hell, it looks like it could fit at least three more conventional, less airborne ships on it. You'd probably get tired walking from end to end on the damn thing if you couldn't teleport. You and Aridin mosey over to the dressing room of the airship. The room is filled with a surprisingly wide variety of outfits, from various capes to casual t-shirts to flock cosplay to... Well, there's a ton of shit in here. There's a pile of ornate sticks in the corner, too. You wonder... Don't touch the one pile, by the way. They don't do anything. Since magic is fake as shit, after all. You resist the urge to laugh in his face. Of course magic's real! Those are all just confiscations. That I confiscated from unscrupulous lowbloods. In a store. With, uh... My many stacks of cash given to the owner. Definitely not something I like having here. Right. Your eyes wander a little bit more around the room. And beside the elaborate costumes with crazy labels, angsting ensemble, really? You see a lot of really fancy dresses. They look pretty neat. You kind of want to put one on. It's about time for you to add another fan art generating attire to your wardrobe. Hell no, those dresses are mine. Wait, really? You were a little surprised. You knew he had a sense of fashion, but you didn't know that his sen that his taste was so good. The dresses look so pristine. You ask him if he's ever put them on himself before, or if he ever just keeps them here to look nice. Of course I put those on before. Just their private use only, you know? Before you get the wrong idea, I'm not like thinking about my gender or anything like that. But when I put them on, they just feel nice and breezy and shit. I mean, let's be real, gender's more like more or less a fake as hell mess that puts unnecessary restraints on people's lives anyways. It's just so arbitrary, you know what, what I'm saying? To nobody's practical benefit, I might add. It's not even like there weren't trolls who were assigned differently at birth even back as long a, a long ass time ago. Point is, the concept that gender is a strict binary isn't archaic. It's just flat out wrong. And I think it's honestly really kind of fucked up. Especially since people go out and say it's a, set, a stone set immutable fucking little wall. Or the people are, are just using it as an excuse to divide people up and flaunt their superiority. There is something in Aridan's voice that makes it clear he spent a lot of time thinking about this stuff. Something about the way he's recounting it all that makes you think he didn't learn this sort of stuff to impress people or appear woke, as the kids say. Or for any reason beside the subject factoring into his personal development in some way. Maybe. Maybe he isn't so bad. Anyways, let's talk about the Hema Spectrum. Anyone lower than yellow is gutter blood trash that probably doesn't deserve the hollowed life they live. Which is why I planned to so many raids on their neighborhoods from this very airship and spent so much time sniping leagues in the air and shooting holes into low blood feet. That'll show them to how with less satisfactory essences coursing through their veins. You immediately fall to your knees and start throwing up on the floor. You quickly reassure Aridin that you didn't unceremoniously barf all over his likely priceless carpet in response to his overwhelming classist, his overwhelmingly classist, classist sentiments and conflicting, almost hypocritical viewpoints on different hierarchical power structures. No, no, you just puked your guts out for some other, completely different reason. It was probably just something in the air that smelled. Something's probably just full of shit. Yeah. Whatever you say, I guess. You decide to hit the controversial go back button and challenge Aridin on the much more interesting topic that came up. Why isn't he very public as an ally if he's so fascinated with the subject of gender? What are you kidding? I'm not an ally, I haven't fucking done anything. 
even if I were, I don't know if you noticed from my whole quadrant situation, but people know and hate me. It's like, I've been such a relentless flirt that it becomes policy at some theatres and restaurants for employees to stab specifically Erd and Amper in the hand, if I annoy them. Which isn't too big a deal, because Violet Bloods like me are pretty fucking sturdy, but I suck and I bet half this whole planet knows it. The extent that, like, if I openly supported something like the destigmatizing of gender non-conforming trolls in the existing group would hate me and anyone outside those would use me as an excuse to deride the seriousness of it all. And I'm not going to be selfish about this thing in particular. Oh. You didn't really think about it all like that. Even then, surely it wouldn't be as bad as Erdan thinks, right? Eh. At this point I'm used to being hated. Comfortable with it, even. At least it means someone's thinking about me. There's a palpable loneliness in his words. Maybe this is why he's so desperate all the time. Anyways, let's talk about something else. Like Solix. Do you know if he has the rumored and highly sought after double bulge or not? Just curious. What? Fuck it, I'll ask him myself. Before you can say anything else to dissuade him from simultaneously being a huge creepy asshole to one of his friends and possibly unraveling one of the most unnecessary mysteries of troll biology, Aridan whips out a palm husk and starts frantically dialing in some numbers with extreme precision. Hey. For fuck's sake, this better not be about your ex again. Didn't I tell you a million times to stop talking to me already? First of all, don't rub it in about feff piss blood. I can come to your house and put a bullet through your skull. Second of all, no, I'm here to ask something else. Do you have a fucking double bulge? Wow. What the fuck? You kind of hate this conversation. When you look at Aridan, you get the feeling that despite initiating it, he kind of does too. He's pacing around frantically. I heard the rumors, pal. First off, not your pal. Second of all, what makes you think I don't have a triple bulge? Fuck off. Listen. We aren't unraveling this mystery for a couple sweeps, at least. It's way too fucking funny to do that. You are way too goddamn lame. But why do I even talk to you? You should be fucking ecstatic that I graced you with my effervescent present, goddamn phone presence. You mean palm husk. But what the fuck ever, dude? Cranky because I'm fucking irresistible, aren't you? Fuck you. Ever since this apocalypse got fucking cancelled, you turned into this completely moronic e-boy, and it's drawing me out of my goddamn mind. Elmeo, do you even know what an e-boy is? I bet you're just mad because you got cucked by me super hard. But what? Yeah, I've basically been making out with FF for the past 30 minutes now. What? Hey, Solix, who are you talking to? An entitled sub. Put Feff on the phone, you quadruple horn dick shitter. Oh, are you finally making fish puns? Yeah, I'm definitely making some kind of pun right now. <laughs> Listen, you stupid motherfucker, next time I see you, I will kill you. Really now? Are you really murderous today? Or just trying to get your daily nagging in on me? Listen, how about we both settle this whole ass mess now? I'm gonna head on over to that airship you keep driving around the neighborhood in two hours. Get your dumb ass over there and fight me, fuckboy. You hear a beep from the phone. Solix hung up. Aridan's face softens from an expression of rage and anger into one of tranquility and calm before he starts to laugh a little. <laughs> I'm about to go on. <laughs> wow. You put a hand on his back and congratulate him. He seems as anxious as he is ecstatic at the moment. Somehow, he's completely changed his demeanor from when he was talking to Solix. It was like he was almost playing up his awfulness. He starts mumbling to himself about what he's going to do and say to Solix when he gets here. A lot of it sounds pretty rude, but also rather performative, like what a wrestler says when they have fictional beef. You decide to take this opportunity to snatch a cape. Gotta update your ever-growing wardrobe. Some time passes, and you make your way to the airship deck with Aridan, who's having trouble keeping his face from cracking into a smile, or at least the closest expression you've seen him to having one. Solix hovers in front of you, a couple dozen feet above. When you look up at him, his frown contorts into something more akin to a snarl, and red and blue energy starts crackling around his eyes like lightning. Remember when I asked you to stop calling me? But what? 
I've asked you literally 40 times to stop doing that, and so many other things. And you haven't listened. So I've decided I'm gonna cut you out of my life, one way or another. Understand? Uh... You look at Aridin. He looks a little less ecstatic than he did before. He gazes directly at Solix above him with a worried look on his face, shifting his general stance so that he can better keep his balance. You have a feeling this was more than he bargained for. You look down to the ground and reflexively brace yourself for impact. You felt combat psionics before with us, Daja, and shit gets crazy fast. It's a good thing you did, too. You hear a much louder crackle this time and look back up at Solix, an aura now visibly, now visibly enveloping his body, his glowing red and blue with lightning still energizing into existence inches away from his eyes. You feel the shockwaves of pure psionic force weighing you down, making your legs feel more like jelly every second. It's as if gravity itself is bowing down to Solix. Come on now, this is... is this... uh... is this all you fucking got? Something about Aridin's feeble taunt tells you that this is absolutely more than he bargained for. Nevertheless, he pulls out his gun and aims it right at Solix with complete unwarranted confidence. Solix's psychokinetic force is so overwhelming that your legs give out and you hit the deck, stomach to the floor, knees to the ground, and ass in the air. Yeah, there's pretty much no way you can stop this. Solix shoots fucking laser beams out of his eyes and Aridin returns the favor with his own gun's laser, resulting in the most anime-ass beam struggle you've ever seen. The clash ends in a huge explosion of smoke that obscures everything from view. To find the force of the blast, you zap into the smoke to get a better look. You're quickly met with a vast array of shurikens spinning wildly through the air in front of you, towards Aridin, using the smoke as a cover. Aridin blasts most of them away, but the largest lodges itself right into the barrel of his gun. As if to say, nothing personal, jackass, Solix flies out from behind, swiftly kick drop-kicking Aridin into a cannon, which seems to have been loaded with... glitter? When Aridin crashes through the other side, his collapse covered in scrapes and confetti. He's bleeding less than you expected. Nothing personal, jackass. By the time Aridin gets up and dislodges the shuriken from his gun, Solix has disappeared from both of your fields of view. Where the hell did he... You hear literal tons of rock crumbling from below. You look down and see nothing. You look left, right, behind you, all around, upwards. Ah. He's above you. Pointing upward. Levitating some kind of humongous... Some kind of... Is that a fucking shopping mall? Did Solix bring a fucking mall to a gunfight? Wait, that mall... It's that mall. The one where, in an errant timeline, Daria pleaded with you to take her to Earth, away from this hellish planet society and into a world that was even the slightest bit less bleak. You lose yourself briefly in your thoughts. You couldn't help Daria then, and now that it'd be easy to, fulfilling that one request is impossible to get again. It's so frustrating. You couldn't save Daria, you couldn't save anyone. Maybe it's too late for you to do that, but... Maybe you've been fucking around too much today. Maybe... Just maybe, there's someone you can save right now. That mall is massive, and if it collides with the ship from that high above... Oh fuck, you have to get out of here. Gotta give you credit here, Sol. Nobody's ever tried to maul me with something so fucking big. What the fuck do you mean, maul you? What does that even mean? Maul isn't a verb! No, hold on. Okay, see, but we are thinking of two different words that sound the same. Wait, I literally could not care less. Solix fling flings the thankfully abandoned Maul directly at Aridin with what must be an ungodly amount of psychic force, screaming his throat raw the entire time. Okay, fuck, it's now or never. You have to get off this ship now. Aridin might be durable enough to survive getting dropkicked through solid steel with nothing more than a couple scratches, but you? You're fragile. You'll probably die from tripping on the stairs wrong. But even then, there's no way Aridin's getting out of this unscathed. Maybe you have time to save him. What should you do? Alright, so we are going to get in there and save Aridin. You can't just sit here and let someone, even someone like Aridin, get sandwiched in between a massive airship and an entire fucking mall. You've got this. You're about to jump in like a fucking action hero and save Aridin. What is there to worry about anyway? All you have to do is teleport in and out. Alright, step one, teleport in. You zap right in front of Aridin and he immediately shoots your arm off. Okay, ow! Aridin clearly wasn't planning to injure you so badly. You quickly see that he's rocketing to the edge of the ship, using his gun's blast as propulsion. Fuck, he already had an escape plan, and 
Jesus, fuck, this hurts. Your arm, or what's left of it, feels like it got plunged into the fucking sun. Why did no one tell you that sudden laser beam amputation hurt this much? Distracted by the pain, you find it hard to even focus on warping out of here. You can't even bring yourself to focus on Solix yelling, fuck, 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 as the titanic shopping structure hurdles towards you. You try to steady your breathing, calm down, and try to focus on the reality around you. Unfortunately, reality doesn't stop for you, and neither does the unflappable march of gravity, as the sheer force of them all crushes you to death. If only you were a little less fragile, maybe you'd find two boys surrounded by the rubble of a crash site, shaken at the fatal consequence of their spat. Game over. No. Uh, so we're going to do- it's too dangerous, get off the ship without him. Fuck it, he'll be fine. If there's anything he needs help with right now, it's something a little bit deeper in his soul than the fact he's being attacked by a building. You try to think of somewhere to zap. Anywhere. While you do this, you notice Erdin fire a blast towards the ship from his gun, propelling him away from the center of impact. You, meanwhile, just need to get out of here, as fast as your mind can take you, so you close your eyes, zap away, and feel your surroundings change. You find yourself in a wasteland. There's a ton of smoke in the distance, coming from what must be the site of the airship's crash. He takes solace in the fact that Solix was cognizant enough of his surroundings that he chose not to send the ship crashing into a city full of people, because of the beef he had with one dude. After a bit of walking, you see the source of the smoke in the distance. The wreckage is astounding. There's sharp metal fragments and concrete pointing out in all directions. Standing in front of all of it is Solix. You frantically zap your way towards him and ask him if he and Aridin are alright. Well, that'll show a guy not to ask people about the shape of their bulge. Yeah, we're both fine. He's not dead. Oh, thank god. For the record, I haven't actually made out with FF or anything yet. Now let's just to rile him up. You ask Solix what Aridin did to him that was so bad he wanted to kill him. Okay, first of all, definitely didn't want to kill him. Way too much of a hassle. I would know if he was about to die anyways. Second of all, this Athwipe calls me at the ath crack o'clock and either spouts some high blood superiority garbage he doesn't even believe or complains about his love life basically every fucking day. So what he's saying is that throwing a mall at Aridin was just to send a message? Pretty much. You know, not long ago, he actually tried to pay me lots of money to wiretap FF just to see if she ever talked about him. Oh jeez, yikes. Naturally, I took all the money and didn't do that at all. Massive waste of time and energy, not to mention skeevy as fuck. I actually told her about that because it was kind of hilariously pathetic. It's how we got talking in the first place. But enough about me. I don't even care about this guy. I get your real French stick, but he's not your responsibility, nor mine. Maybe Solix is right. Maybe it's not your job as a friend to make Aridin feel better, to fix his problems, or set him on the right track. That's probably why his Moirel, why everyone, gets sick of him. But, like, you're supposed to do something here for everyone. You can feel it. Like, you're supposed to smear your huge ass over Destiny and say, Eat my ass, Destiny, all these kids will get a chance at good lives. Hello, man. You sure this isn't just some kind of hero complex? Maybe? Probably. You just wish Aridin could be a little less of a toolbag. Is that too much to ask? Well, I guess you can do whatever you want. I won't stop you. But he doesn't deserve this, you know? Maybe not, but this doesn't change what you're going to try and do. You've got a lot to say to Aridin. You wave Solix goodbye and make your way around the field of rubble. It only takes you a few minutes to find Aridin, sitting on some rocks. No, 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 no. Fucking... That hurt like hell. He's alive. Of course I'm alive. You think I die just because I got a building thrown at me? <laughs> Actually, no. If I didn't blast myself out of the way, I'd probably have been buried under a lot more rubble. Probably wouldn't have been able to dig myself out. Salix probably could have done that, but if he went this far to kill me, I really doubt he'd do that willingly. There's no way he hates me in a way that'd lead to a decent Caligna's relationship. I was actually pretty close to biting the dust here, huh? Hey. Do you ever think to yourself, 
that you have all the power you could ever want or need and every whim cater to with ease and that even despite all that your happy moments are as fake as magic is maybe even more fake there's no way I'm not doing something wrong here after all this I can only wonder what you think of me I'm just a scumbag who keeps setting himself up to fail right you ask Aridan if he wants the truth, wondering aloud if he can even handle it. Listen, I'm not going to be in any more pain than I'm in right now, having been dumped three consecutive times. And also getting crushed under several ton tons of concrete too, I guess. I can handle the fucking truth, so just give it to me. In front of you, you see an absolutely hopeless moron who's achieved their station in life through no work of their own, and who's placed all of his stock into social lies. He's cherry-picked the ones that have worked for him and rejected all of the others. But what has that done for him, really? Absolutely nothing. Believing in this society has only ever hurt him. Maybe not in the same way it's hurt your other friends, but not even trolls on the top of the heap are immune to, to Alternia's brand of poison. He's a six-week-old kid who's ultimately just scared, lonely, and confused. Someone who doesn't have to be hopeless. Someone who can violently burn away all his failings and rise from the ashes like a phoenix who decided maybe this next life. Let's not be so fucking racist all the time. So you tell Aridin to get up from his throne of wreckage on his sunken ship and start making his way to some pit stops of self-betterment before more people take grievance with him the way Solix has. Then maybe he can tear down all the false hopes that comforted him through the sweeps. Damn. I... Okay, not that that isn't surprisingly deep cutting and helpful advisory reflection, but like, there's no way I'm gonna remember all this. Yeah, gotta at least r write this down or something. Don't worry, this is a text-based game. There's definitely gonna be transcripts available online in a matter of hours. I'm gonna be honest here. I'm gonna have it to ruminate in all this for a while. But I think I'm tired of being and feeling so waffle all the time. I just... I don't know where to even begin with myself. I think that you might be asking a lot more of me than you think. Life never stopped asking a lot from you. Fair point. It's definitely going to be a long process. There's pretty much no way you can force feed the guy a redemption arc in the span of today. Hell, you'd be surprised if he didn't still suck a year from now. But even the shittiest kids can change a lot with a good push in the right direction. Hey, uh, thanks for sticking by me, even if only for today. Of course, you tell Aridan. What else are friends for? And besides, your day with him isn't over. Well, wait, what do you mean by that? After all this, you will want to still spend time with me? Absolutely. You take Aridan's hand and pull him up to his feet. After all, you two have a movie to watch. Oh, this is my this swamp. is my swamp. <laughs> As you've had occasion to remark before, Alternia is a dark world, both because it's night all day long and because of its hideously brutal society. Where there's a strong prey on the weak, the weak prey on the weaker, and all this preying ends only when the survivors are shipped out to prey on everyone else in the galaxy. Alternia's cruelty has been on your mind for a long time, but recently it's begun to feel intolerable. You decide to take a walk in the woods to calm yourself, but it seems that with every step your mood only grows darker, your agitation greater. As you walk, you remember the names of Alternian friends who've fallen to the planet's injustices, and your mood goes from bad to worse. You've been waiting around like a spoiled, self-centered narrative device for a lightning bolt of illumination to reveal your reason for living. To explain your peculiar and insatiable hunger for friendship, and to show you the destiny attached to it. You think you know who caused this, but why? You've been sitting here like a child waiting for a teacher to explain the answer to a difficult math question. Friska and Terezi are arming up to change the world, and what are you doing? Your usual bullshit, you're thinking. You're navel-gazing. And then, with a sudden blinding clarity, you understand. Friska's right. Terezi's right. The answer is revolution. Who gives a shit? Who cares what some big dumb universe thinks your destiny should be? You'll take Dream Boldier's advice and choose your own fate. Take the answer to the meaning of your life into your own hands. Set your own course. The gods, the fates, the universe, or whoever will have to jump back pretty sharply because your direction is clear to you, at least. Your agitation turns to indignation. Your indignation to outrage. Outrage to anger. Anger to fury. Fury to ferocity. Ferocity to white-hot resolve. 
The horrors of this planet have got to stop, and you are feeling particularly dramatic today, doubtless due in part to the shift in narrative tone and general prose quality in this episode. So, now is the time. Alternia's cruelty and violence have upset and shocked you since you've arrived, but as more and more of the population suffering under these wrongs have become your personal friends, it's become unbearable. You've been wondering all along who will make it stop. Now you know the answer. If you are the main character, then you have to be the one to get the ball rolling. And if you've begun to suspect that you can't die for reasons seemingly tied to your function as a narrative device, so that's a bit of characterization you can bring to bear. No longer will you linger in the wings, waiting for the narrative to summon you to heroic. With this momentous decision girding you for the unstinting effort, you set your mind to the question of how to accomplish it. You start by making an inventory of the strengths and weaknesses you possess and can bring to bear on the task. Strengths. 1. Experience drumming up friendship in the most unlikely situations. 2. Ability to travel instantaneously anywhere you want to go. Weaknesses. Everything else. This helpful mental exercise clarifies matters significantly. You see clearly that the only way for a single humble being such as yourself to change Alternia is to go directly to the point of maximum leverage. In other words, straight to the top. You'll need all, well, both, of your resources in this quest. You'll need to travel superhumanly and superluminally into the immediate company of Alternia's ruler and throw your full friendship game on them, with the objective of persuading them to initiate reforms, change rules, and set the planet on a course to civilization. But your darting intellect realizes something else. It won't be easy. The ruler of a world such as Alternia must be a fearsome, fell creature, a monster of no ordinary loathsomeness and cruelty. On Alternia, you've seen gigantic ravening luci, genocidal clowns, murderous highbloods, and every kind of grisly crime, to a point making belief in Santa Claus almost impossible. It stands to reason that the leader of such a world must also be the cruelest, gruesomest, most terrifying being of them all, a being of nearly impossible evil. For the first time since this plan caught fire in your mind, a whisper of doubt creeps in. It occurs to you that the most likely outcome of your quest for the reformation of Alternia is a scenario where your internal organs are festooned over a wide area, your eyes popped out of your skull, and your brains splattered to a fine mist. While experience suggests that you're non-killable, that sort of thing may offend, not to mention be excruciatingly painful. We are going to say, maybe it would be a better idea to have a light lunch and lie down until your reforming mood passes. Oh, come on. If you, an indispensable narrative device with nearly superhuman befriending powers and actually superhuman traveling powers, won't try to reform Alternia, who will? Have you no pride, no grit, no old college spirit? Go back and select the right answer. So we're going to, say, press on fearlessly with your quest. Scorning all difficulties, you decide to press on fearlessly with your quest. You gather yourself, consign your soul to heaven or whatever, and prepare for the worst. You close your eyes and think, take me to the highest being on Alternia. Then you grit your teeth and prepare for the ultimate horror. You feel the familiar sensation of superhuman uh, slash superluminal travel, and the world changes around you, rendering you somewhere else, somewhere that feels quite different from your previous forest location. Very different, actually. A lot wetter. It quickly becomes apparent that there's good news and bad news. The good news is that instead of an eldritch monster, you can materialize next to a rather pleasant-looking troll girl with fins on her head and wearing goggles and a tiara. The bad news is that you're drowning, as you seem to have materialized in the middle of an ocean. Glub, kelp! Your own greeting may seem a bit less cheery in that it consists of thrashing wildly with your eyes bucking out as you fight not to inhale, while trying to concentrate on zapping yourself the heck out of here. The troll girl watches in astonishment, but suddenly seems to understand. You see her take a big breath of water through some gills on her neck, and then something starts to come out of her mouth. A bubble. The bubble expands and expands until you feel its boundary break over you, and suddenly you can breathe. You collapse, coughing and gasping into its floor, which feels like the inside of a huge submerged balloon, yielding but effectively keeping the water at bay. The troll girl sits across from you in the bottom of the bubble, studying you curiously and anxiously. Glub, 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 glub. Are you okay? Recovering from your, bru uh, from your brush with drowning, you're able to notice with relief that despite her con uh, conversational quirks, she looks friendly, even glad to see you. You try to say something, but all that comes out of your mouth is water and a sputtering sound. I don't speak whatever language that is. It's very pretty, though. You burp and some water trickles out of your ears. Sorry, I still don't understand. Do you speak any Alternian? With great effort, you gasp. Yes. Oh, yay! My name is Fafari Patious, Glub Glub. What's your name? You bubble weakly. It's nice to meet you, Glub. 
-hmm. You nod politely, expel another half gallon of water, then weakly say it's very nice to meet her too. Not least because if she hadn't been there, things might have gotten unpleasant for you. You're welcome! But what are you doing here? Almost nobody comes this way. It's not really on the way to Anemone wear. She looks sad when she says it, and you wonder that some poor troll child should be living all by herself way out in these submerged parts so far from anyone. How did you manage to appear out of nowhere like that? You almost gave me a heart attack, Glub Glub. You tell her that you were trying to use some superhuman powers you had to visit the highest being on Alternia. The troll girl seems to perk up at this. You wanted to come visit me? You shake your head vigorously to try and get the water out of your ears. The troll girl looks disappointed. Glub, you didn't come see me. You apologize and say that you're quite happy to be visiting her, but that you misheard her last remark. You thought she'd implied that she was the highest being on Alternia. Just goes to show how deep submergence and waterlogging can cloud your hearing. Oh no, Glub. You heard me right. I am the highest being on Alternia, most of the time. I'm the future Empress, heiress to the throne of the Alternian Empire. Which is a great big glubbin pile of whale poop as far as I'm concerned. What? You look around for the multiple razor-toothed, fire-breathing, and acid-spitting heads, tearing claws, and bad attitude that you're sure Alternia's highest being must have. But then you start to remember your Alternian social science. You haven't had any formal Alternian education, you're not sure, even sure narrative devices, however indispensable, are eligible to sign up for classes. But you pick this stuff up when you hang around a place long enough. So you know that the Empress spends most of her time off-planet leading merciless troll hordes in conquest of the galaxy. You also know that there's only ever one other member of her royal uh, fuchsia bloodline, the heiress, in existence at any time. As long as the Condis doesn't kill her on her rare visits to the home planet, that is. The troll girl glubs sadly, and you realize that being the only fuchsia blood on the planet must be lonely. Not only would you have enough strength to accidentally tear any troll who visited you limb from limb without noticing, but you've heard some sinister things about the heiress's Lucis. Something about it being the size of a continent, hungry as the void of space, and evil as the hell devils to go as their bad devils. Something that might discourage casual visits by friends who don't want to double as snacks. But at the same time, you wonder that such a seemingly agreeable and sensitive troll as this girl could preside over such a grindingly horrible planet as Alternia. How does she live with herself? Does she even know what goes on outside her insular little ocean? But you put all that aside for now. Here you are, right where you wanted to be, where you made your master plan for Alternian reform. You haven't been devoured, dismembered, or decapitated, and the person you wanted to persuade seems eminently persuadable, not to mention friendable, so you're ahead of the game so far, time to take full advantage. Your Royal Highness, you begin. Blub! Call me Feth! Blub. Blub. It's much friendlier to be on first name basis, and I'm so happy and excited to have another friend! Perfect. Phase one of your plan seems to have practically accomplished itself. But there's no time to waste, as the air in the bubble your new friend created is starting to get stuffy, and you know you're going to have to zap out of there soon. You mention in a casual conversational tone that you've been visiting Alternia for some time now. Glove, do you like it? It's certainly unusual. Heh, <laughs> that's putting it lightly. I'm sure everyone's been incredibly mean to you. Well, yes, to start off with at least. The sea dwellers think they're so much better than everyone else here. They're just a bunch of shellfish, arrogant bassholes. The high bloods prey on the low bloods, and no one cares how other people feel, or even if they live or die. Drones fly around, krilling anybody weak or useless. Oh, well, she seems to know. Hmm, maybe she's got plans of her own. Phase two of your plan is half in the bag already. You feel dizzy suddenly at how your quest is working out without the least effort on your part. Also from the lack of oxygen. You're gasping for breath, and a darkness is gathering at the edges of your vision. In about a minute, you're going to pass out from oxygen deprivation. What's to be done? Alright, so we are going to zap yourself the heck out of there and back to Alternia's surface, where at least you can- where you can at least breathe. You're fading fast. A black tunnel is closing around you, and sounds are getting dim. With your next to last strength, you grab Theft's wrist and zap her back to the surface with you. You're not yet done persuading her to reform, to reform Alternia. Then you realize you don't even know if she can breathe air. You feel like it'd be wrong to suffocate your new friend on your very first visit, so with your last strength, you let go of her wrist and zap yourself back to the surface alone. You materialize superhumanly and superluminally back into the forest. You lie in the tall razor grass for a while, gasping, darkness receding from your eyes, sounds clearing in your ears. 
Once you feel sufficiently reoxygenated, you sit up. You have a pounding headache, but otherwise seem fine. Y your emotions are deeply conflicted. Yes, you can breathe. Yes, you're safe. And yes, you realize with deep satisfaction you've made a new friend. But what about your quest to save Alternia? The fairy seems to be aware of the problems of her kingdom. Is she perhaps waiting on the right ally, or Eli, as she might call it? You prepare to immediately zap back to finish the job. But you hesitate. What if you zap back into that bubble and merely continue to suffocate? Or what if she's already collapsed the bubble and you materialize in the water again? What if she's not there to rescue you, or is so annoyed at your rudely abrupt departure that she decides to just leave you to your own devices? What if her Lucis notices you thrashing in the water and snatches you with its eldritch tentacles for a plaything or hors d'oeuvre? Not that you can drown or suffocate or die of mastication, but can you really not? It felt like you were drowning and suffocating quite efficiently there only a few minutes ago. You hesitate some more. Even if you can't die, the torment of drowning and suffocating felt quite real. How long might such torment go on even if you didn't die? Would an eternity of suffocating or drowning be all that pleasant even if you kept living? What about an eternity of being chewed and passed through a giant Lucis' di digestive tract? You realize that you can't bring yourself to zap back to the Aris. You curse your weakness, but given a choice between death and eternal torment, you realize with belated humility that your choice would be neither. Even if there's a chance you could save Alternia, you stand up sadly and begin walking back through the forest. Made a friend, but fail at life. Game over. Aww. Alright, so we're going to say, uh, stick around and test out the whole you can't die hypothesis. You're fading fast, a black tunnel is closing around you, and sounds are getting dim. You wiggle your fingers and try and gasp out an entreaty. Glub, are you okay, Glub? For re reply, you clutch your throat, fall heavily to the floor, and lose consciousness. You gradually regain consciousness, as you and as you do, you realize that air is going through your lungs. Fresh, oxygenated air, the most beautiful thing you've ever felt. You realize that you're in a palatial, though messy, bedroom. And while you can see underwater realms outside the windows, the room itself is dewatered. The fresh air seems to be coming from a large conch shell sitting on the floor nearby and humming quietly like an air purifier. You're swooned on a chaise lounge, and Fafari Patius is fanning you with a large palm frond. Glub! Are you alright, Blub? Why didn't you tell me you couldn't breathe? You scared the patient out of me! You struggle upright and try to smile bravely. You apologize for scaring her, but observe that one of the symptoms of not being able to breathe is not being able to talk. You thank her effusively for saving you. Club, that's an empress's duty. Instead of encouraging people to be mean and hurt each other, she should do whatever she can to help them. A tear comes to your eye and a lump to your throat when she says that. If she really means it, you have a couple of suggestions. Of course I mean it. I'm gloved at, ha uh, at how abyssal things have been around here. When I'm empress, things are going to be different. You respectfully wonder how long it will be before she becomes empress. Only a couple thousand more sweeps. Oh, cool. What happens to everyone alterna on Alternia in the meantime? The fairy looks momentarily thoughtful. I don't know. I haven't thought that part out. I guess I'm not equal to, uh, to my big ideas. And what if when she becomes empress, she feels differently? How does she know her imperious condescension didn't feel the same way as the fairy does now when she was her age? What if there's something that makes adult empresses evil? Something they can't control? What if a fairy grows up to be socially liberal, but fiscally conservative? What a horror bubble thought! You have to strike where you, while the iron's hot. Never leave till tomorrow what you can do today. A stitch in time saves nine. Procrastination is the thief of time. The longest journey starts with a single step. It's no use crying over spilled milk. You hope a fairy has been convinced because you're running out of cliches. Glub. The era still looks uncertain. Everything you say is plumb and true. But rebelling against the Empress? It would be so dangerous. And I'm not sure it would be right. It might cause Gipglib to make the vast glo uh, glub that would destroy everyone, you know? Oh, glub. You mean gulp. You didn't realize that. You're not sure what the vast glub is, but it sounds bad. Oh, it is. Before we do an an Amani we need more guidance and advice. As Eris, I have a special metaphysical periscope, you know? You didn't know that. It sounds made up, but a little metaphysical advice certainly might come in handy as a at a time like this. Without further delay, the heiress goes to an ornate jewel-encrusted tube that rises from the floor of her palatial bedroom. It seems to extend into the underwater depths, though air pressure seems to be keeping the water from flowing through it into the room. 
She yells into the tube, louder than you would have thought someone so agreeable looking could yell. Glub, 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 There's a swishing, gurgling sound, and something extends through the tube into the room. Something pale and featureless as elusive, but unmistakably a tentacle. A tentacle with a bulbous eye on the end of it. You dive bene uh, behind a luxurious sofa. You'd rather that the heiress is loosest than see how plump and tasty you look. But almost immediately, the eye settles itself on top of the tube and hardens into something that looks like a very crystal ball. Shapes move and change inside this crystal ball, then resolve themselves into a scene, a scene you recognize. You realize with a shock. You come out from behind the sofa and approach the crystal ball, staring into it. In its depths, a dark place appears, and in the dark place, a carnival carousel rotates. Wooden horses going up and down, and above them, naked plastic mannequins with plastic wings hang from wires. The dark carnival! Jumping Jehoshaphat, is that where Fafari gets her metaphysical advice? The scene grows clearer and closer, zooming in on one of the horses, and on the figure riding it, your heart begins to beat wildly. It can't be, but... Honk! Suddenly, you're dancing around the room with joy! You grab the fairy and whirl her as you dance. At first she gasps in surprise, but then she gets into the spirit, grins, and begins to whirl too. Her strength is such that she spins you like a fan blade, your blood all going to your legs. And when she lets you go, you hit the wall like a bullet and ooze down to the floor. But as you recover consciousness, your joy is barely containable. You never thought you'd, uh, to see that sweet, sweet fellow again, but here he is. And evidently he's come up in the world because he's, a communica he's communicating exclusively with a royal fuchsia blood princess. You're so proud your heart feels about to explode. My friend Glub here. They have a plan. Well, you wouldn't go that far. I'm just not sure what to do. Honk, 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 honk. Just hold on. The fairy adjusts some controls on the bejeweled tube. They must be translation controls, because in mid-sentence, Karaka's remarks change from semantic honks into conventional language forms. And when they do, you realize that this isn't the same Karako you knew about way back then. Honk honk! What you ask is not simple, little one. To truly know the answer, you must learn that there is much more to your story than meets the eye. You must expand your vision to see the big picture, an even bigger picture of which that big picture is only a pixel. Yes, I know that. This isn't the usual glub shit. Not silly quadrant glove shit for Wigglers. I need some real answers here! You study Karako. He's obviously the same troll, but the changes in him are equally obvious. His eyes are as deep as wells, his face grave and kind. Either he's done a lot of reading and undergone a lot of life experience since you last saw him, or else he's become the honking mouthpiece of some vast mystical wisdom-type entity, which offers metaphysical advice to princesses. Perhaps whatever person or process sustains the Dark Carnival? But how did Karako get that job? You wave madly at Karako, and he and the heiress talk. But either he doesn't see you, or he no longer knows you, or he thinks imparting serious metaphysical advice is too solemn an occasion for waving like a maniac. Either way, he ignores you and keeps talking. Does a troll who paddles an ore vessel down a rushing river control her own fate, or does the river control her? The answer is, of course, both. The river has force, but within the, uh, that, the troll can move her boat where she will. You are the heiress. And thus, the fate that sweeps you along is vast and swift and powerful, but also your arms are strong and your ore vessel set. Do not despair of your own strength. Yet there is more. We see by mystic means that the rushing river you navigate itself uh, is itself being swept along by an unimaginably faster rushing cosmic river, and that the planet which that vast cosmic river traverses itself is being swept along an even infinitely greater super cosmic river. There are many such metaphorical cosmic meta river levels in this particular instantiation of the story. Thus, even if you row with utmost power to change your course on the river you are navigating, the river you can see, the other meta-rivers continue to sweep you along as before, without regard for any tiny adjustments you may make down at your level. Yet do not despair! You may yet, uh, through long and deep meditation, transcend the boundaries of this small world, rising higher and higher so that you are able to see and comprehend and transcend those vast and meta-vast meta cosmic river levels one by one. And what you can see, you can learn how to navigate using meta-vessels and meta-ores fashioned from metacosmic star stuff. Yet also remain humble. Above the creator of this world is yet another creator, and above him yet another greater creator than- uh, another creator greater than even than him. And above her, yet another creator. These vast powers move all things like pieces on a chessboard. Yet, if the chessboard pieces grow wise enough, they may move the movers. The powers that move these universes upon universes are unimaginably large, and yet you are unimaginably small. Yet nonetheless for that you are in your smallness, and your small world are indispensable, like a key piece at the bottom of an infinitely tall Jenga tower. 
Knowing these things, do you wish to undertake the great work of awakening and enlightenment that will bear you into the full light of reality? It is a work of millions of mantras, thousands of sweeps, and hundreds of lives. Or knowing these things, do you instead choose to ply your vessel in the waters of your own world, remaining the person life has made you? Remaining a key, yet unknown piece in the towering stack of universes influencing your own destiny on your corporeal river, swept to destinations beyond your understanding and fulfillment of the larger story? Either choice is noble, little one. Your only duty and burden is to choose the one that seems best to you. The fairy turns to you. It's clear that both courses described by the wise ones speaking through Karako hold attraction for her, and that she's on a razor's edge between them. The merest word from you will be enough to lead her in one direction or the other. Which way do you choose to lead her? Influence the heiress to choose the path of meditation and transcendence. Well chosen, little one. Step forward and tell your cheese-like companion to step forward, too. A friend to share your transcendental journey is a blessing, and they seem a noble and loyal cheese, though perhaps a bit overexcitable. You and Fafari step forward, and Karaka's hand comes right out of the crystal ball, divides in two, and taps each of you on the forehead. At the tap, you feel powerful fire course up your spine and through your chakras, and the roaring flames obliterate all the world. When the flames subside, a resonant silence reigns. You and Fafari are seated in full lotus position on either side of a fresh air conch, cozy in a bubble, floating deep through the vast oceans of Alternia, where you can never be found by anyone until you emerge fully enlightened with the power of gods, many yugas hence. Eternal Spiritual Siblinghood Victory Huh. And we're going to choose, influence the heirs to choose the path of worldly action and accomplishment. Well chosen, little one. Step forward and tell your marshmallow-like companion to step forward, too. A helpmate to share your worldly efforts is a blessing, and they seem a noble and loyal marshmallow, though a bit manic in the hand-waving department. You and Fafari step forward, and Karako's hand comes right out of the crystal ball, divides in two, and makes gestures of blessing over your heads. You immediately feel strength and courage coursing through you, and as the loosest tentacle turns back into an eye and withdraws from the tube, you turn to look into Fafari's sparkling eyes, and you see that she's feeling the same intrepid energy. Yay! I think a good portion of that was love ship, but still! He has an eely good point somewhere in there. We can't just be canoes, we have to be fish. Even if, at the end of the day, we're still just little minnows, we'll be whales to someone. You start to grab her for a dance, but recalling your previous experience, quickly turn the gesture into an offered high five, which he slaps, breaking several bones in your hand. What shall we do, you ask her? What's our plan? You feel the ability to accomplish any plan fairly overflowing from you. You'll have to introduce her to Terezi and Vriska to start out with, at least. Yes, yes! Glub! But first, I need some time to think. I'm so excited! I'm sure the purpose of your visit was to reveal build the whale of the destiny that awaits us. But we need to consider our next move. Will you come back to visit me again soon after some, uh, some tides have passed? Then we can compare knots. Yay! Glub, glub, glub! This is gonna be so fun! Noble Worldly Partnership Victory. Thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.